This is Belgrade, the dazzling capital of Serbia. People from all over the world are attracted to this city for its charm and beauty. From the quiet cafes to the sparkling nightlife, Belgrade is a city that never sleeps. It's one of the most fun cities in, in the whole world. It has magnificent architecture, peaceful parks, splendid restaurants with authentic Balkan food. Always. Remarkable art, electrifying museums. This is where it died. A city between east and west with a turbulent history to tell. But what makes Belgrade the most appealing is the spirit of its people. Belgrade has the most interesting men and the most enigmatic women. Some of the best sportsmen in the world are from Belgrade. Anyone who experiences Belgrade will undoubtedly fall in love with it. Welcome to my city. My name is Boris Melagursky. Everything that I love has its place in my city. This building holds one of the finest historical collections in Europe. The National Museum of Serbia in Belgrade has over 400,000 objects, including many great masterpieces by Renoir, Monet and Picasso. This is one of the things that put Belgrade at the cultural heart of Serbia. It is also a national treasure. Aside from priceless artifacts from all periods of Serbian history, the museum's greatest prized possession is the earliest example of Cyrillic manuscript in existence, Miroslav's Gospel dating back from 1190. I believe Serbs are the most history-conscious people in the world. This collective memory is one of the main things that motivated Belgraders to start preserving and protecting the cultural heritage of Serbs in 1844, when the museum was founded. Belgrade is a town with a scent of history, passion, and a feel-good atmosphere. This is probably why Belgraders love it so much. I love Belgrade because of the spirit of its people. Belgrade has been called the Paris of the Balkans, a reputation fully supported by the gaiety and warm friendliness of its inhabitants. You never feel alone when you're in Belgrade. It's always easy to meet new people, mostly when you least expect it. Belgraders make the city what it is. Ciao, Ciao. But it didn't always used to be this way. For centuries, Belgrade was a city under occupation. The National Museum itself was a result of the Serbian National Awakening, when Serbia was fed up with Ottoman rule and demanded freedom. The first Serbian uprising that started in 1804 was a revolt against Ottoman control, led by Karadjordje, founder of the Karadjordjevic dynasty. This was the first time that Serbia envisioned becoming independent again, after three centuries of foreign occupation. Even though it was brutally crushed by the Ottomans in 1813, the revolt sparked the second Serbian uprising two years later, led by the founder of the Obrenovic dynasty, which resulted with the creation of modern Serbia. The leader of the revolution, Miloš Obrenovic, became prince of the newly formed Principality of Serbia, who knows what Serbia and Belgrade would look like today if it wasn't for this man. He was a true revolutionary and his legacy lives to this day. Nowhere is his spirit felt more than at the mansion he built for himself in Belgrade, the place 
where Prince Miloš died. This is also one of the last remnants of traditional Balkan architecture. Miloševkonak, Konak, as the mansion is called in Serbian, preserves the ambience of the anti-Ottoman struggle during these revolutionary times in an excellent historical exhibit. Next to the mansion, right here, this is one of the oldest and most beautiful platinous trees in Europe, planted about 170 years ago. According to the legend, this was the last tree that Prince Miloš ordered to be planted in a limestone hole. This is why the tree grew so fast and got its beautiful white color. In 1881, the tree had to be reinforced with iron because the 35 meter high tree couldn't withstand the weight of its branches. I can understand why Prince Miloš decided to build a mansion right here in Topčider Park. Even today, it's so tranquil and peaceful in these nice surroundings. Belgraders love their parks. Relaxing in Belgrade is serious business. There are 65 public parks in Belgrade that cover an overall area of 36 hectares. My favorite park is around the Kalemegdan Fortress. Kalemegdan, an old Turkish word for battlefield, is the most popular park among Belgraders and for many tourists who visit Belgrade. A green oasis in urban Belgrade, the park has many winding walking paths, picturesque fountains, shady benches, historical architecture, and breathtaking river views. It is also the oldest section of the urban area of Belgrade, and for centuries, the city's inhabitants converged only inside the walls of the fortress. Thus, the history of the fortress, until the most recent history, equals the history of Belgrade. Archaeological evidence suggests that the area of today's Belgrade was first settled some 7,000 years ago. The Neolithic Starchevo and Vincha cultures existed in or near Belgrade and dominated the Balkans. The Vincha script, a set of symbols found on artifacts from the Vincha culture, is considered the oldest excavated example of proto-writing in the world, predating the development of writing proper by more than a millennium. Right now, I'm about 14 kilometers from Belgrade center, in the small Belgrade suburb of Vincha, where one of the largest and most important prehistoric Neolithic settlements in Europe was discovered in 1908 by an archaeological excavation team led by Miloje Vasic, the first schooled archaeologist in Serbia. In the older Starčevo settlement, located in the deepest layers of Vinča, mud huts and tent roofs were discovered in which the settlers of the Starčevo culture lived and were also buried. During the period of the Vinča culture, houses built of wood that was covered with mud were erected above ground with complex architectural layouts in several rooms. The houses in the settlement are facing northeast, southwest, with streets between them. U 10,5 metara arheoloških naslaga u Vinči upakovano je 7,5 godina života u kontinuitetu. Ovde u Vinči se živelo bez prekida od 5,5 godina pre nove ere i ni jednog trenutka se ovde nije prekidao život sve do danas. 80% arheoloških naslaga u Vinči nastalo je u prvih 1000 godina života, što će reći da se ovde u Vinči najintenzivnije živelo upravo u Neolitu. Vinče ne samo jedan od prvih evropskih gradova, nego Vinče je i prva evropska metropola. Around 270 BC, the Thracian Singi tribe that was settled here was replaced by the Celtic Skordisci, who were returning from their unsuccessful attack on Greece. The Celts gave the settlement its first name, Singidun, the town of Singi. When the Romans took over around the date of Christ's birth, they gave it a more Romanized name, Singidunum. One of the first Christian emperors of Rome, Jovian, was born in 331 AD in ancient Singidunum. The remains of the walls of the Roman legion camp, Castrum, can be found today in the Roman hall within the library of the city of Belgrade. Later, Avars, Goths and Huns all took turns at occupying the city, until Serbs arrived to make Belgrade their capital in 1403. The city prospered during the rule of despot Stefan Lazarevic. He restored Belgrade and turned it into a political, cultural, trade, and tourism center. The new name of the city, Beograd, meaning White City, comes from a letter by Pope John VIII 
to Boris I of Bulgaria concerning the conduct of a local bishop. If you look at Belgrade today, it seems like it's everything but a white city, filled with all the colors of a palette. The walls and towers of today's Belgrade are purely white, only on the city's coat of arms. In 1427, Belgrade fell under Hungarian control, and in 1456, Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror led an Ottoman army of 150,000 soldiers against Belgrade. With help from the Crusaders, the Turks were defeated, and it was considered such a great victory that the Pope ordered for all churches to ring their bells at noon every day in commemoration of the victory at Belgrade. I decided to take a trip back in time, and I visited the only remaining mosque in Belgrade out of the 273 that existed during Ottoman occupation. The Bayrakli Mosque was built around 1575, and the only reason it survived the two-decade Austrian rule in the 18th century when most of the other mosques were destroyed was because the Bayrakli Mosque was turned into a Catholic church. When the Ottomans returned, they reinstalled it as a mosque. Today, there is very little physical evidence of the centuries-long Ottoman rule of Belgrade, but it did leave an influence on the culture. For most Belgraders, the day starts with the Turkish coffee. Though people in Turkey prefer to drink tea. On their way to work, they might pass by the Dorchal neighborhood. Dorchal being a Turkish word for intersection or four roads. On the car radio, they might listen to a type of music that is called turbo folk that has its origins here. A blend of Serbian brass bands and sometimes Middle Eastern beats and Turkish pop music. When the Turks left Belgrade for good in 1867, the city was once again the most significant city in the Balkans. During World War I, most of the subsequent Balkan offensives occurred near Belgrade, while the city itself was mostly destroyed. After the war, Belgrade became the capital of the new Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, later renamed the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. The new country crumbled when the Nazis heavily bombed and destroyed much of Belgrade in 1941 and carved up Yugoslavia between the Axis. Serbia was under military administration of Nazi Germany. Parts of Belgrade belonged to the independent state of Croatia, where the pre-war trade fairground was turned into the Sajmište concentration camp for Serbian Jews, Roma and political prisoners. Later, Germans took control of it from the Croats. When the war was over, Belgrade became the capital of the communist Yugoslavia under Josip Broz Tito. During this time, Belgrade grew rapidly. Industries were nationalized and self-management by the employees was introduced by the government. There are people in Belgrade who will tell you that communism was the worst thing that ever happened to Belgrade, or Serbia for that matter. And there are those who will firmly argue that life was never better in Belgrade than during Tito's communist era. Based on the number of attending politicians and state delegations, Tito's funeral in Belgrade was the largest statesman funeral in history. He was buried in the House of Flowers in the Dedinje neighborhood of Belgrade. This wasn't just the death of a president, it was the death of an era, and the bloody dissolution of Yugoslavia was just around the corner. In 1980, the eyes of the world were on Belgrade. The East, the West, the non-aligned, all of their hearts and thoughts were with us. But with the rise of nationalism in Yugoslavia, exploited by politicians like Slobodan Milosevic, Franjo Tuđman, and Ali Izabegović, the country lost its good reputation and slipped into war. In the 1990s, the country Belgrade was the capital of was getting smaller and smaller. The Belgrade government, under the control of Slobodan Milosevic, had to handle rivers of refugees from Croatia and Bosnia, anti-regime demonstrations, the world's second highest inflation rate ever in 1993-94, mafia shootings and, eventually, the NATO bombings of 1999. 
Today there are still visible scars from the bombing. Even though almost everyone here agrees that the NATO bombing was illegal, after it the people were fed up with Milosevic and the stage was set for the bulldozer revolution. On October 5th, 2000, after weeks of protests due to alleged election fraud by Milosevic, rivers of people from all over Serbia streamed into Belgrade to bring down the Milosevic regime. One of the most memorable moments from the day-long protest was when a bulldozer operator, Ljubislav Djokic, nicknamed Joe, fired up his engine and used it to charge the state television building, a symbol and bastion of Milosevic's rule. The next day, Milosevic admitted defeat and people started picking up the pieces after a decade of instability and war. Belgrade was always known for its fast recoveries. After the fall of Milosevic, people were full of hopes and prayers for the future. In the same year, restoration began on one of the holiest sites for all Orthodox Christians, the Temple of Saint Sava, in the Vračar neighborhood of Belgrade. Dedicated to Saint Sava, founder of the Serbian Orthodox Church and an important figure in medieval Serbia. It would not be wrong to say that this Orthodox Church took forever to build. Construction started in 1935 but it was interrupted by the German attack in 1941. When Belgrade was liberated, the communist government decided to use this unfinished church as storage space. It was not until 1985 that construction continued. The greatest achievement of the process was the lifting of the 4,000-ton central dome, which was built on the ground, together with the copper plate and the cross and later lifted onto the walls. The lifting, which took 40 days, was finished in 1989. What we have today is perhaps the most monumental building in the city. The temple dominates the cityscape, an undeniable example that persistency, in the end, pays off. The look of Belgrade has changed many times over the years. It was destroyed in many wars, but also rebuilt every time. A testimony to the resolve of all Belgraders to keep the city alive. Nowhere in the world can you find men that are more interesting and women that are more enigmatical than in Belgrade. Style and good taste in fashion makes Belgrade very pleasing to the eye. If a wonderful face is enough to stimulate interest, the city's irresistibly gorgeous, elegant and affectionate women are sure to make you fall in love with them. Starting from the Kalamegdan Fortress, Knez Mihailova is more of a fashion show platform than a pedestrian street. Named after Prince Mihailo Brenovic, whose statue stands right next to Knez Mihailova on Republic Square, a place where people usually meet up, popularly called At the Horse, Knez Mihailova is definitely the favorite promenade for Belgraders. The beauty in the endless flow of humanity makes this street the place to go and be seen. To many, physical appearance means a lot. And from this way of thinking arose a type of women that are popularly called sponsorushe, or, loosely translated, trophy girlfriends. There is a saying in Belgrade about the motto of the sponsorushe, you look after me, and I'll look pretty next to you. The best place to see this is Strahinicebana Street, better known as Silicon Valley. The name comes from the silicone attributes of the Sponsorusche that accompany their gangster boyfriends. In recent years, many tourists have come to Belgrade not only to see the sights, but to improve their sight as well. Medical tourism is beginning to flourish, and nowhere is this more evident than at the Sveti Vid, meaning Holy Site, Special Hospital in Belgrade. Nice to meet you, Marina. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, can you tell me uh, what kind of conditions does this hospital deal with? 
Zapravo radi se o jednoj kompletnoj oftalmologiji koju pružamo, mogućnost tretmana u različitim oblastima od prednjeg do zadnjeg segmenta oka, uključujući i pediatrijsku oftalmologiju. To su problemi urođenih katarakti, urođenih glaukoma i problem slabovidosti koji nije bio tretiran ovde. To je ovde postala rutina i mislim da je ovo adresa koja je po tome širom sveta poznata. So I understand you received some award through your contribution to world ophthalmology. Yes, we are very proud about it because it was World Congress in Bombay mm -hmm. and I was a winner with a film from Sveti Vit with Marina and together we put together. I heard that this was the, the first time in world ophthalmology that, that uh, somebody had conducted this kind of procedure. Can you, can you tell me what it was? It was a very complicated case. We implanted him artificial cornea and thereafter we discovered that he has a cataract mm. and through that uh, small piece of plastic never has been done such a surgery. Well, I went for a stroll through Tashmaidan Park in the city center. Tashmaidan is an old Turkish word for stone quarry. In fact, most of the stone needed to build Belgrade was found right underneath these grounds. The small hills of the park are hollow. Not only that, there are several locations around town, including Kalemegdan, where you can go underground and experience Belgrade beneath Belgrade. Special tours will take you to see caves, dungeons, walled rivers, tunnels, bunkers, and other structures built by peoples who settled in Belgrade. During Nazi occupation, the Gestapo used the underground caves in Tashmaidan as bomb shelters. In 1999, Serbian state television, located in Tashmaidan Park, was bombed by NATO forces. Part of the building collapsed, trapping people who were working in the building that night. 16 people were killed, while many were trapped for days. This monument evokes more sad memories of the NATO bombing. It is dedicated to all the children who died in the bombing of Serbia. Overlooking the monument is the Church of St. Marco. Built just before the start of World War II, it's modeled after the famed Gracanica Monastery in southern Serbia. There are two stories about the individuals that are buried here that I must tell you. The first story is about the golden age of the Serbian Empire. Dusan the Mighty was king of Serbia and emperor of the Serbs and the Greeks. He was a man of gigantic proportions, and according to papal ambassadors, he was the tallest man of his time, estimated at close to seven feet tall. Under his rule, Serbia reached its territorial peak, and the Serbian Empire was one of the larger ones in Europe. His dreams were to conquer Constantinople and replace the declining Byzantine Empire with the Greco-Serbian Empire under his control. Dusan's grand intentions were all cut short by his premature death in 1355. It was not long before Serbia was under occupation by the Ottoman Empire. The second story is a tragic love story set in late 19th century and early 20th century Belgrade, our very own royal version of Romeo and Juliet. In 1895, the king of Serbia, Aleksandar Obrenović, met Draga Mašin, a woman who was not of royal blood. It was love at first sight. Aleksandar shocked the entire kingdom of Serbia in 1900 when he announced that he would marry Draga. Patriarchal Belgrade wasn't ready to accept a queen 15 years older than the king, and also a widow. Harsh reactions were aimed at disgracing Draga's reputation. Even the Metropolitan of Belgrade didn't want to wed them. Then Alexander threatened the Metropolitan that if he won't marry them, Alexander would leave the throne and run away with Draga to France. The Metropolitan eventually gave in, and Alexander and Draga were married. But the king's popularity plummeted after that. The people were demanding an heir to the throne, but the couple couldn't have a child. On the night between May 28th and 29th, 1903, the old palace was stormed by rebels. Alexander and Draga hid in the cupboard in the queen's bedroom. After nearly two hours of searching the palace, the conspirators found the royal couple. They had them shot. and their bodies mutilated and thrown from a second floor window of the palace. The king was only 26 years old. This is the old royal palace where they were killed. Today the building houses the city assembly of Belgrade. 
It was built in 1884 in the style of academism of the 19th century. This beautiful building is also a place where we welcome our champions in many sports. The new royal palace, known as Beli Dvor, or White Palace, got its name because of the facade made of marble stone brought from the Croatian island of Brač, the same marble stone that was used in building the White House in Washington, D.C. The architect of the building was inspired by 18th century English houses such as Ditchley Park. The Belidvor interiors are decorated with English, Georgian and 19th century Russian antiques by the French design firm Jensen, which later decorated the White House during the administration of John F. Kennedy. Belidvor was supposed to be the future residence of the three sons of King Alexander I Karadjordjevic when they became older. However, King Alexander was assassinated in 1934 on a state visit to France and the palace was given on loan to Prince Regent Paul and his family. Queen Maria and her sons continued to reside in the royal palace. When communists took power after World War II, the royal family was in exile, and Bailey Dwar was used as an unofficial residence and office of President Tito. During the 1990s, President Milosevic also used the palace as an office. Today, the palace is inhabited by Crown Prince Alexander II Karadjordjevic, Crown Princess Catherine, and his three sons by his first wife, who all moved back to Belgrade when Milosevic was deposed in 2000. Belgrade has been through many rough times. Being a Belgrader was never easy, but people stayed here because of their love for the city and for its people. And if you look at the faces of ordinary people in Belgrade, most of the time they look very satisfied. It's like they found this amazing place where they can live a nice life in a pleasant community. What more could they ask for? Okay, get ready. Because I'm going to talk about a topic that's very dear to me. Maybe it will help you better understand why Belgraders love their city so much. One aspect of Serbian culture and tradition that is always enjoyed by visitors to Belgrade is the food. Belgrade takes pride in its art of cooking. Experiencing the taste of Serbian cuisine really means getting to know an important part of Serbian culture and the historical influence at a crossroads of civilization makes Belgrade the perfect place to indulge in Serbian gastronomy. Perhaps the best place to start is at what is known as a kafana, a sort of traditional restaurant or tavern. It might just be the most important element in the life of a Belgrader. It is a place where one comes to relax with family and friends, a place where politics and football are discussed, and a place where business meetings are usually concluded. You know, every Belgrader has its favorite kafana. And every kafana has its Belgraders. Right here is the oldest standing kafana in Belgrade. It is situated in a Turkish-style house from 1823. Constructed for trade representative Naum Ichko, the house was later obtained by Toma Echim, the personal physician of Prince Milos, who opened a cafe in it. After changing owners several times in 1892, it got the name at the cathedral, for its close proximity to Cathedral Church. However, church authorities regarded the name as an insult and demanded the name change. While the owner was thinking about how to name the cafe, he hung out a sign with a question mark on it, which people mistook for the new name. A name that has stayed to this day, mysterious, and alluring. There are so many dishes that are characteristic for Belgrade and the Balkans. Burek, Cevapcici, Pjeskavica, Karadjordjeva Šnicla, Mučkalica, Podvarak, and my favorite, Sarma. There are more bakeries in Belgrade than you can imagine, and they smell just mesmerizing. Burekđenica Sarajevo serves some of the best burek you'll ever try, and the low tables and chairs make for a unique experience of going to breakfast in the morning. For a place right out of a Saint Exupery fairy tale, one need not venture further than the Mali Prince or Little Prince confectionery, 
a heaven for anyone with a sweet tooth, it will make even the strongest melt with desire for sweet goods. I bet you didn't know there was a Bermuda Triangle in Belgrade. It consisted of three kafanas in Makedonska Street. It got its name half a century ago because people would quite simply <laughs> disappear for a couple of days while in here. In a way, this is what kafanas represent. Places where you can go and take some time out from regular activities. I decided to take some time out as well and treat myself to, in my opinion, one of the finest restaurants in Belgrade, Kalamegdanska Terrasse. Located where the name suggests, it has charm blended with the atmosphere of the 13th century fortress, with excellent local and international food, as well as a wide selection of foreign wines, not to mention the breathtaking views of the Danube River. At nighttime, many kafanas create an amazing party atmosphere. And perhaps the most unique one is at the Korchagin Kafana. With a Yugo nostalgic theme, Korchagin offers live music, cheap drinks, good food, and a night you'll never forget, depending on how much you drink. But beyond the excellent food and atmosphere, the term Kafana stands for something more. It stands for a bohemian lifestyle, embodied in the part of the city known as Skadarlia. Initially a gypsy settlement, Skadarlia soon evolved into an artist hotspot for its low-cost apartment renting and close proximity to the National Theatre. The kafanas of Skadarlia became centers of literary and artistic life, a neighborhood with a truly bohemian spirit. Belgraders like to compare Skadarlia with Montmartre in Paris, but I think that's just pushing it a bit. There is a joke about a famous bohemian poet, Jura Yakshish, who used to live in Skadarlia. Now, Jura would get drunk in one of the kafanas every night when he would come back from work. But one night, he decided he's not going to stop at a single kafana, he's just going to go straight home. And he passed all the kafanas in Skadarlia, went home, stopped on his doorstep and said, Juro, you're a real character. Let me buy you a drink. Today, Jura's Skadarlia house is still used as a poetry venue for the famous Skadarlia Nights. The Kafanas of Skadarlia all claim they are the oldest, the most authentic, and they all compete in unusual names. My hat, three hats, two deer, there are days. To see if this is still true today, I sat down in one of them, the Sheshirmoy restaurant, or My Hat. I love grilled food, and for someone like me, Belgrade really is a paradise because grilled food is always on the menu, everywhere you go. I had to order my favorite dish, chevapchichu kaimaku, which is a sort of grilled minced meat served primarily with kaimak, something similar to clotted cream. The truth about the kafanas of Skadarlia is that they are all marvelous, and all of them are essential in forming the spirit of the Bohemian Quarter. In Belgrade, everything starts and finishes with the rivers Danube and Sava. They are a vital part of the lives of Belgraders. Not many people know that Belgrade and Berlin are the only two European capitals that encompass two major rivers. Ushche, literally meaning confluence, is the area around the confluence of Sava into the Danube. I decided to hop on a boat, one among many that offer tours, and go for a cruise along the rivers. The Sava River offers captivating views of downtown Belgrade. I was surprised to find out that the area has 16 river islands. We quickly approached what is sometimes called the Belgrade Hawaii by Belgraders, Adat Ziganlia, an island in the Sava River. This is Belgrade's focal point for mass sporting activity and recreation. It also has one of the most crowded city beaches in Europe. Another famous island is the Great War Island, that marks the mouth of the Sava River as it empties into the Danube. Don't get scared by the name of the island, it got its designation because of its strategic importance in wars and battles of the past. 
Today, about two-thirds of the island are used as a nature preserve for numerous bird species, many of which are endangered. On the northern tip of the island, there is a famous beach called Lido. See, over there you can see Kula Nebojša or Nebojša Tower. It was built in the 15th century to protect the Belgrade Harbor. It was used as a dungeon and a torture chamber where, among others, Greek revolutionary and poet Riga Sarayos was executed and thrown into the Danube River by the Turks in 1798. Thanks to the cruise, I was able to see Belgrade from a different perspective. I experienced breathtaking views of the Kalamegdan Fortress and the Old City, and was really in a good mood afterwards. So I went for a stroll on the long, beautiful promenade along the rivers in the Ushche area. This is Friendship Park at Ushche. Many great world leaders, politicians and famous people who visited Belgrade planted a tree in this park, a tradition started by the communist government of Tito. Under each tree there is a plaque that says who planted it. Truly a piece of history. Hey, where are you guys from? Hey, hey. we're in Toronto. How's it going? Not bad. Yeah. yeah. So, where are you going out tonight? So, we're going to some club, like, uh, club on the water. So, we, we'll see. We're excited because there's no clubs like that in Canada. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like it here much more. This is my favorite city in the world. I, uh, and you're from Canada. You like the city more than anywhere yeah, else in Canada. I mean, I live in Toronto, but this city is where the love is at. The love is in the air. Oh, I'm from Australia. I'm from, uh, I'm from Melbourne. And you like Belgrade, huh? Love it. It's nice, huh? It's very nice. <laughs> Beautiful women. Yeah, he knows it. Belgrade is a city that seems to wake up when the sun goes down. With a reputation for offering a vibrant nightlife, the friendly atmosphere, great clubs and bars, and the lack of restrictive nightlife regulation, make Belgrade the perfect place to party and have fun. Recently proclaimed the world's best party city by the largest travel guide book publisher in the world, Lonely Planet, Belgrade is proud of its nightlife. With relatively cheap accommodation and drinks, the choice of alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages offered in Belgrade is truly commendable. One of the more popular kinds of drinks in Serbia is called rakija. Rakija is a sort of brandy made from naturally blended plums or grapes or herbs. The most popular kinds of rakija are called Shiovica, and then we have Lozovaca, Klekovaca, or even Viljemovka. As for beer, Belgraders love love, which means lion in Serbian. And then there's, of course, Yelen, which means deer, deer beer. Uh, as for wines, for red and pink wines, we have Vranac, which is the most popular one. Um, we also have Kosovsko Crno or even Sar Lazar. For white wines, the most popular ones are Banatski Riesling, Karlovački Riesling, and my favorite, Smederevka. Živeli. The city's clubs, pubs and bars, discotheques and cafes are absolutely perfect for relaxation or buzzing to the sound of lively entertainment. A typical night out in Belgrade starts around midnight and lasts until the sun rises. No matter which music genre you prefer, there's a club in Belgrade for every taste. Some of the more famous clubs among the youth are Academia and the famed KST, located in the basement of the University of Belgrade's Faculty of Electrical Engineering. In the summertime, Many nightclubs relocate their downtown sites to the splavs or floating rafts along the river banks. They are ideal locations to spend warm summer nights in Belgrade. Most of the splavs are parked between two bridges in the Sava River and at the Danube embankment behind Hotel Yugoslavia or Grand Casino. A few are on Ada Tsiganlia as well. People who like to listen to Western music go to splavs like Plastic. And those who like Serbian songs flock to the syndicate splav. One of the newer splavs is Hot Mess, where you can chill during the daytime as well, and actually swim in a pool inside the splav, while the atmosphere explodes when night falls. 
The vivid and energetic nightlife of Belgrade make the city a paradise for young Belgraders, as well as the tourists who visit it. Belgraders simply love going out and socializing. There is a lot of unemployment in Belgrade, while the average monthly salary in Serbia is quite low. Going out is a form of escape for most people, a way to forget about the day-to-day -day troubles, let go and have fun. Many like to escape the hustle and bustle of the city and drive up to Avala, a hill overlooking Belgrade, with splendid nature and also where the tallest tower in Serbia is located. You can go on top and enjoy the spectacular views. Closer to the city, the Košutnjak Park is a great place to cool down in the shade, sit down in one of the several restaurants, or even have a barbecue, as many Belgraders do, especially during the May Day celebration. For those who can afford it, shopping in Belgrade can be very satisfying. There is a saying in Belgrade for visitors to the city. If you don't spend at least half a day strolling or shopping, nobody will ever believe you visited Belgrade. To find out what the latest fashion is, people go to Knez Mihailova Street, which I already described as a sort of never-ending fashion show in the center of Belgrade. This is also the most lavish shopping street in the city, with stores selling top designer clothes, antiques, books, local craft, gifts, music, etc. Not to mention that you can also check out several amazing art galleries in the street. The largest and most famous Belgrade marketplace is called Kalinic. Since it was built in 1926, it has been the most popular marketplace not only for people living in the city center, but also from other parts of Belgrade. It's famous for its quality fruits and vegetables, dairy products, and in the summertime, there are lots of quality melons, acacia honey, and even teas prepared according to traditional recipes. For a taste of science, a short walk from the marketplace will take you to the Nikola Tesla Museum. Tesla was an American scientist of Serbian origin who gave his greatest contribution to science and technological progress as the inventor of the rotating magnetic field, as well as the complete system of production and distribution of electrical energy through the use of alternate currents. The only Serbian whose name is an SI unit, Tesla is the unit for measuring magnetic induction. He also constructed the famous Tesla coil. This is where I die. The museum is located in a residential villa that was built in 1927 and was used for various purposes until 1952 when the Nikola Tesla Museum was founded. The material for the museum was brought to Belgrade by Sava Kosanovic, Tesla's nephew, who transferred all of the documents and Tesla's personal things to Belgrade after Tesla died. Do you think Tesla was the greatest inventor who'd ever lived? Yes, I think for sure. Uh, Tesla was a real genius, the simple, modest and unique mind, who made his most important discoveries and inventions at the end of the 19th century, his visionary ideas and pioneering steps uh, that he made actually more than a century ago are seeing their full implementation just today. Let me use the words of uh, Edwin Howard Armstrong, distinguished professor at Columbia University, electrical engineer and inventor of FM radio, who said once, the world will wait a long time for Nikola Tesla's equal in achievements and imagination. As the only museum in the world which preserves the original and personal inheritance of Nikola Tesla, it is a unique institution of science and culture in Serbia and in the world. Another place that today bears the name of Nikola Tesla is none other than the Belgrade International Airport, constructed in 1962 and officially opened by President Tito. The first local airline that was called Aeroput, later called Yacht Airways and today called Air Serbia, had a very interesting advertising campaign when it started business. In 1927, Tadija Sondermeyer, an engineer, pilot and captain in reserve, piloted a flight from Paris over Baghdad, Basra, Karachi and other cities, all the way to Bombay, India. The 14,000 kilometer trip took 11 days. When the plane returned to Belgrade, 
30,000 people gathered to welcome them back. Belgrade has always been an open city. Even during the socialist era, the city was known to be very liberal. This is probably why Belgrade's hospitality is world famous. The people here are so warm and friendly that visitors won't believe they're in a large city. The ideal blend of small town hospitality, city commerce, and outstanding outdoor recreation make Belgrade a rising tourist attraction, where foreigners are treated with a great amount of respect and even admiration. One more thing that will impress you is the volume of bookstores evenly spread out throughout the city. Belgraders love going to bookstores so much that there are actual places where you can go and have a drink while at the bookstore. A sort of bookstore cafe. But all these bookstores are child's play compared to the National Library of Serbia. This is an important institution that makes Belgrade the cultural capital of Serbia, with over 5 million publications. It was established in 1832 and originally located in the Kosančiće Venac neighborhood. In World War II, the German Luftwaffe bombed and completely destroyed the library building, together with a book collection of half a million volumes as well as irreplaceable archives of old documents about Serbia, a tragedy of unmeasurable proportions. The new building was built in 1973. Next to it, overlooking the Temple of St. Sava, is the famous monument to Karadjorje, who was the first to lead the Serbs in the revolution against the Turks. Erected in 1985, the bronze statue stands where Karadjorje's troops had set up camp in 1806, before engaging the Turks in the battle to liberate Belgrade. If we go further, we'll find Slavia Square, a real driver's nightmare. Seven streets converge in the square. The circular crossing, with the vehicles coming from every direction, is really a challenge for new drivers. Before 1880, the area of today's Slavia Square was a swamp, where people went wild duck hunting. When Francis Mackenzie, an English businessman, bought a large piece of terrain just uphill from the present-day square and divided it into building lots that he sold, the development of the area started. Even today, this part of Slavia is called Englezovets by some, meaning Englishmen's. Right next to it is one of the first McDonald's in the region. However, for Belgraders who prefer fast food Serbian style, the number one choice would have to be Duff. Although the name isn't original, the people don't seem to care about that. Even though the prices are a bit higher than the average, the top quality makes up for it. My favorite is the Stapin Vyat Grill restaurant. But more moderate prices and a quality to which no one can remain indifferent, not even legendary German former football player Lothar Matthäus, Stapin Vyat really is a great choice for all fast food lovers. After all this food, I could sleep for a few hours. It seems like whenever I think Belgrade is missing something, I'm always proven wrong. This city really has everything a person could need. I'm too full. I can't walk now. I got in a taxi. Not only will a taxi provide you with a cheap ride, there is probably no better way to find out about the tone of the society in Belgrade than to have a chat with a taxi driver. They are like a living encyclopedia of the city. But not only that, most claim to be experts in recent history, politics, and current issues in the city, as well as the country. All this, of course, with the aroma of amateur philosophical arguments. When there's little traffic, driving around Belgrade is a great experience. For car enthusiasts, the Automobile Museum is the best place to go, with a wide collection of cars from all periods of time situated in the first public garage, built back in 1929. This modern garage housed the cars of the participants of the first international car and motorcycle race ever held in Belgrade on September 3, 1939. 
Back then, Belgrade had only 360,000 inhabitants, while 75,000 people came out to watch the race. The cars were driven around the Kalemegdan Fortress, and it was the biggest sporting event in Yugoslavia, certainly the most visited event in the Balkans at the time. The museum today holds over 50 vehicles, the oldest being an 1897 Moreau Gardon. But it represents more than just a collection of automobiles. Bratislav Petković, the collector and owner of these automobiles, sees the car as an invention that incorporates all the inventions of mankind, from the earliest, like fire or the wheel, to the latest, based on microprocessors. As somebody who loves to drive, coming here really makes me appreciate the history behind it even more. Well, I'm really impressed. Uh, you know, seeing some of these cars reminds me a bit of my youth. Um, first, some of these American cars that I've seen more in movies. So it's really neat to see. The evidence of passing ideologies throughout history in Belgrade is still present today. Some of them brought suffering and war, while some left behind a rich history and tradition. The architecture of Belgrade was very much influenced by various ideologies. While not all of it has survived due to the turbulent past, the architectural inheritance is still one of the most beautiful in Europe. It's interesting to see the social transition from east to west in the architecture of the post-Ottoman era. Built in 1831, Princess Ljubica's mansion is a prime example of the so-called Serbian Balkan style, with a western influence on the decorative classical elements. The mansion was constructed on the order of Prince Miloš Obrenović, and it was to be for his wife Ljubica and their sons Milan and Mihailo. The mansion was used for various purposes after Aleksandar Karadžorđević came to power. Today, it is part of the Museum of Belgrade, and it is used as exhibition space. The permanent exhibit includes original furniture made in the Oriental Balkan style and many other styles of the time, such as Classicism, Biedermeier, and Neo-Baroque. For an example of a classical and Baroque style mixture, I visited the Saborna Orthodox Church. Like Princess Ljubica's mansion, this church was constructed on the order of Prince Miloš in 1840, who was buried here in a crypt together with his two sons, Mihailo and Milan. The church is not only significant for its appearance. Vuk Karadžić, the most important Serbian linguist and major reformer of the Serbian language, was buried here. His name Vuk, which means wolf, was given to him because all of his brothers and sisters died of tuberculosis and he was left as the sole survivor. It was believed at the time that witches feared wolves and therefore the name would protect him from any evil they could inflict. Whether you believe in that or not, he did live on to standardize the Serbian Cyrillic alphabet which is still used the same way today. As Vuk used to say, write as you speak and read as it is written. Another great Serbian educator and writer was buried here, Dosite Obradovic. I wanted to find an example of classicism in the city, so I visited a seemingly unlikely place to find this, a secondary school. This magnificent neo-Renaissance three-story building was constructed in 1879 according to the plans of architect Nikola Kolar to accommodate the secondary school of Zemun that was founded 20 years earlier. In 1916, the new part of the building was built, fashioned in the manner of post-accession, representing one of the first modern architectural structures in the city. The first hospital for civilians in Belgrade is also one of the main examples of Romanticism-style architecture. Located in George Washington Street, it was built in 1865. But perhaps the best example of this type of architecture is Captain Misha's building. The building was completed in 1863, as the private palace of Misha Anastasievich, who was known as the Danube Captain and was the richest person in Serbia at the time. Its architecture was influenced by various styles with dominant elements of Romanticism and the Renaissance. Today, the building houses the office of the rector of Belgrade University. This is also the building where the University of Belgrade was originally located when a royal charter was granted to the institution in 1905. Today, it is still the highest educational institution of Belgrade in Serbia. The university has 31 faculties, 8 scientific institutes, and a library. 
In one of the more monumental faculty buildings, built in 1940, is the law faculty of the University of Belgrade, the oldest legal school in Serbia, founded back in 1808. <laughs> prorekli da ako se usvoje amandmani na ustav koji je tada pripreman, da će to voditi raspad u zemlje i upravo se to i desilo. However, to get a real taste of student life in Belgrade, one has to go to Student City, an urban neighborhood in Novi Belgrade, which is the student campus area. So how do you like studying in Belgrade? It was uh, so far a nice experience. It's okay, I'm from Belgrade, so I can only study here. Ne dopada mi se obrazovni sistem uopšte kakav je kod nas. Ja bi to promenio iz korena. There is, there are a lot of chances to meet new people, to learn new things, to study. Studentski život iskreno meni naj, najlepši period. What do we do for fun? <laughs> We're uh, around our uh, uh, exam terms we mostly study but I don't know I go out and my friends I guess to the clubs Volimo da se družimo provodimo dosta vremena zajedno Our budget doesn't allow us to have any extravagant fun Volimo da delimo različita iskustva znanja Optimistic group of people and especially here in the student town in New Belgrade Students are one of the most important factors that shaped Belgrade's history and society they are most aware of all the social, political, and everyday life problems, not only within the student realm, but also in the entire country. For example, in 1968, there were mass demonstrations in Belgrade, then capital of the socialist Yugoslavia. The students protested against vast differences in social classes and also against social injustice. Then President Tito ended the riots by saying some of his most famous words, the students are right. At the beginning of the 1990s, students in Belgrade attempted to overthrow the Milosevic regime. There was an incident on Branko's Bridge when a group of 5,000 Belgrade University students heading towards the city center from their residence in Studenski Grad got stopped by the police. Tear gas was used and some of the students were beaten. Even though these protests failed, the students never gave up. Some students organized into a movement called Otpor, or Resistance, which was supported by the West, contributed to one of the biggest turnouts ever for the 2000 presidential elections. The leader of the opposition, Vojislav Koštunica, became president of Yugoslavia, while another one of the leaders of the opposition, Zoran Đinđić, later became prime minister of Serbia. Sadly, in 2003, Jinjic was assassinated in front of the Serbian government building in Belgrade, and the students, together with people from all over the country, were back on the streets again, this time to say goodbye to their elected leader. Even though the drive to protest has faded to an extent in the last decade, students are still very much involved in Serbia's social and cultural landscape. For example, theaters here are a very popular form of entertainment. Belgraders love going to theaters. As a city drenched with culture, Belgrade has a lot to offer in terms of theater genres and program conceptions. An interesting fact is that theaters were swarmed by audiences even during the wars of the 1990s. Perhaps it was a way to escape from reality. At the beginning of the 19th century, the idea of a theater as an institution was born an institution that would be of great help in fighting backwardness and illiteracy and would also contribute to the creation of progressive ideas and the growth of national culture. The first idea of a permanent theater in Belgrade appeared in 1851 when the Lovers of National Education Committee was founded. But it wasn't until 1863 that the National Theater was founded. It had a professional ensemble, a management well-educated in theater and literature, a rich repertoire and a stock system. After Captain Misha's building, it was the largest and most luxurious building in Serbia. It was badly damaged during World War II, but quickly reconstructed and later renovated. Finally, the National Theatre had regained its glamour that it had before World War II, with a new building that was added. The National Theatre represents a modern union of old and modern in architecture, and technically speaking, 
one of the most modern theaters in the world. It is the second half of the 19th century that Belgrade became a truly European city. After the Turks left the city, the modernization could begin. The first Serbian photographer, Anastas Jovanovic, took the first report photographs of Belgrade in 1865. The photos show the rebirth of Belgrade, a city reviving its soul after centuries of repression. There are so many perfect locations for photographers that all the images you see in this film are only a fraction of what Belgrade has to offer. Truly a photographer's paradise. Belgrade is a city of diversity. In recent history, people from all over the former Yugoslavia and Serbia have been coming to Belgrade to achieve their ambitions. Belgrade is kind of like the New York of the Balkans. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. This is why there are so many festivals in Belgrade. With over 30 years of history, the Belgrade International Film Festival is the major film festival in southeastern Europe. In the words of the famous Serbian film director Goran Paskaljevic, Fest, as the festival is called, has prevailed, despite tragedy and war, amid disasters and defeat, because its spirit is best summed up by its continued stance against xenophobia and isolation. This festival is truly a place where the best in local and international cinema meet, it has been said, in a spirit of devout communication. Belgrade has always been the film center of the region. Only five months after the Lumiere brothers' first public screening of movies at Paris's Salon Indien du Grand Café, representatives of the Lumiere brothers came to Belgrade in June of 1896. In the Golden Cross Café on Terrazia, André Carré, a spokesman for the Lumiere brothers, presented the same program that was shown in Paris for 25 days. Belgrade was the setting of the first film projection in the Balkans. Ever since that fateful day, Belgraders have been captivated by cinema. Not only that, they've produced some of the world's best motion pictures. In more recent history, Serbian filmmaker Emir Kusturica brought home two Palm d'Or Cannes Film Festival prizes, one for when father was away in business and one for underground. Serbian films won many significant awards and acknowledgements, showing the great vigor and vitality of culture and cinematic art in Serbia to the world. However, Belgrade is really the place where it all started. 1909 was a very important year, because the first permanent cinema was opened. Soon, many other permanent picture theaters were opened in the city. These permanent cinemas were very important, because the first film producers in Serbia were the owners of these cinemas. In 1911, Svetozar Botoric, who was the owner of the picture theater Paris in Belgrade, engaged French cameraman Louis de Berry to start the production of newsreels about events in the capital. In fall of the same year, he shot and showed the first Serbian feature film, Kara Giorgi, a historical drama about the life and work of the leader of the first Serbian uprising. Up until 2003, it was believed that no copies of the film were preserved. But then, Aleksandar Erdeljanovic from the Yugoslav Cinematheque Archives discovered it in the Austrian Film Archives. One of the more notable post-World War II directors is Dusan Makaveev, while one of the more popular actors was Zoran Radmilovic. <laughs> However, almost all of the popular iconic Serbian films were made after the 1970s. My favorites include Who's That Singing Over There? <laughs> Marathon Family. <laughs> both films by Slobodan Sheehan and Balkan Spy by Dusan Kovacevic and Božidar Nikolic. What all these films have in common is one actor, my favorite actor and one of the best actors from Belgrade, Bata Stojkovic. As a theater, television and film actor, Bata starred in numerous comedic portrayals of the small man fighting the system, which made him very popular with Serbian and ex-Yugoslav audiences. He was awarded the Serbian Lifetime Achievement Award for both theatrical and cinematic efforts. Bata remains popular in death as he was in life, while his legacy even remains in modern Serbian slang, which is often permeated with the lines from Stojkovic's most famous roles. 
With so many Belgraders involved in the art of film in Serbia and abroad, it's no wonder Belgraders love movies so much. It's not uncommon to find people from Belgrade in the end credits of big Hollywood movies. Not only that, many world famous people are from Belgrade. I'm sure you've heard of Novak Djokovic. At the time of making this film, Novak was ranked world number one by the Association of Tennis Professionals. He's considered to be one of the greatest tennis players of all time, winning many Grand Slam singles titles for Serbia. Novak also won numerous awards, Novak Djokovic, including the 2011 Laureus World Sports Award for Sportsman of the Year, the 2012 Best Male Tennis Player ESBY Award, and many others. He is a recipient of the Order of Saint Sava and the Order of the Star of Karadžorđe. So can you tell me what makes Belgrade unique? What makes it different from all the other cities of the world? It's full of young people, full of young ambitious people who want to fill the world, who want to uh, show their potential and uh, prove that they can change the world in, in whatever way they, they imagine. I grew up in Belgrade through difficult times when there was uh, bombings and wars and a lot of political and economical problems. But one thing that uh, was always at the back of my mind that I always knew and I was always impressed of is that there is so many united people, especially young people, who have a vision and, and, and a great ambition to, to go outside and, and try to uh, promote Belgrade and, and Serbia in the best possible way. So where do you see Belgrade and Serbia in the future? Well, I believe that, that Belgrade is yet to fulfill its, its potential. And I think that uh, from this state we are in, right in this moment, uh, we can only prosper. I think it's also voted as one of the most fun cities in, in the whole world, you know, to go out because of so many young people full of energy. So Belgrade's future uh, is left upon those people and I believe that they will make a difference. Ana Ivanovic and Jelena Jankovic are the best Serbian women's professional tennis players. Both have had great success in world championships. Serbia won the Davis Cup in 2010. I should also mention that Serbia and Yugoslavia have won many European and world championships, as well as medals in the Olympic Games. More recently, the volleyball team won Olympic gold in 2000, the basketball team won the Eurobasket gold in 2001, and the World Cup in 2002, the water polo team won the World Championship in 2005 and 2009, and the European Championships in 2001, 2003, 2006, and 2012, to name a few. Soccer reigns supreme among many Belgraders, who are mostly divided between two types of fans, those who support Partizan and those who support the Red Star Soccer Club. The Belgrade Derby between these most fierce city rivals and the biggest and most popular clubs is actually called the Eternal Derby. Both the Partizan and Red Star clubs have their own stadiums, which are huge, and museums as well, evoking memories of the most glorious moments in their history. Many Belgraders will remember when Red Star won the 1991 European Cup in Bari, Italy, and the 1991 Intercontinental Cup in Tokyo. And now a little jump from sport to literature. Though not born in Belgrade, Ivo Andrić spent most of his years in the city and it is also the place where he died. Andrić was a Serbian novelist, short story writer, and the 1961 winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. His most famous works include Bridge on the Drina and Chronicles of Travnik. But aside from all that, Andrić loved Belgrade with all his heart and devoted some of the most beautiful words ever written about this city. I won't read them out now though. I'll save the best for last. As I mentioned, these are just some of the citizens that did their job in building up Belgrade's reputation for being the home of talented and hard-working people. But if you ask me, every Belgrader that lives here is necessary to make the city what it is. What's more, people have always been coming here from different parts of the world to enrich our culture and bring new and fresh ideas. 
history can be found around every corner in Belgrade. It seems like every building you see and every monument in every park has its own story to tell. The lives of Belgraders are all affected by decisions made in this building, the National Parliament of Serbia. The building itself took three decades to build. There is an interesting but sad story as to why this building took so long to build. The first brick was laid by Serbian King Peter I Karadjordjevic in 1907, and during World War I, the architect died in a concentration camp, and the plans for the building were lost. So, new plans were made by the architect's son, and construction was finally finished in 1936. It was designed in the academic traditionalism style, with rich interior, architectural and artistic decoration made by the most famous artists and craftsmen at the time. A pair of statues called the Play of Horses by famous sculptor Tomar Osandic flank the entrance to the parliament building. They were placed here in 1939. This is where history was made, most recently the stage for the Milosevic overthrow in 2000. Sadly, a part of the rich library was damaged in the fire while some of the furniture was stolen by protesters. Overlooking the National Parliament is the youngest square in Belgrade, Nikola Pashic Square. Built in 1953, the dominant features of the square are the typical socialistic building of the Home of the Union and one of the largest fountains in Belgrade. Nikola Pashic was a Serbian politician and diplomat, the most important Serbian political figure for almost 40 years. As leader of the People's Radical Party, he was twice a mayor of Belgrade and several times the leader of Serbia and the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes. After the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo in 1914, the Austrian government immediately accused the Belgrade government of being behind the assassination. Austria presented Pasic the July ultimatum, which Pasic labeled as unacceptable. Using the assassination and Serbian refusal as a pretext, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia which was the beginning of World War I. Back then, the border with Austria-Hungary was at the river confluence. This part of the city was occupied by the Austro-Hungarians. With its narrow cobblestone streets, amazing views of Belgrade and the old Austrian-style streets, Zemun is not only the part of Belgrade where you can feel the Austro-Hungarian atmosphere, but also a testament to the strategic importance of this city within a city. Walking around the Gardos, one of three hills on which the historical core of Zemun was built, and its small streets, is a very nice experience. The major attraction of this neighborhood is the Tower of Janos Hunyadi, or the Millennium Tower, which is often wrongfully connected with the historical personality of Janos Hunyadi. It was built and officially opened in 1896 to celebrate a thousand years of Hungarian settlement in the Pannonian Plain. It was part of the massive construction effort which included buildings in Budapest as well as four millennium towers on four directions of the world. Being the southernmost city and then Hungary within Austria-Hungary, the tower was built on the ruins of the medieval fortress on Gardos Hill which barely survived today. The tower was built as a combination of various styles, mostly influenced by Roman elements. There's one more building in Zemun that I must mention. It's a place I like to go to whenever I can. The Madalinianum Opera and Theatre was founded in 1998. It is the center of cultural and artistic happenings in this part of Belgrade. The Serbian stand against Austria-Hungary in 1914 was a typical example of Serbian mentality. No matter how strong a country was, no matter how small the chances for Serbian victory were, Serbs have always risked everything and fought. Almost a third of all Serbs were killed in World War I, with 114,000 disabled soldiers and half a million orphaned children. However, no matter how brutal and unforgiving the historical events were towards Belgraders, and no matter how great the losses were, the spirit of Belgrade and its people was never broken. Nowadays, people luckily don't have to deal with war. The problems many Belgraders face today are more of an economic nature, but we try not to be too upset about it. Even if a Belgrader feels down for some reason, there is a uniquely Serbian way to cheer him up. Hire a personal trumpet band. These local orchestras are called trubaci, which literally means trumpet players. I'm Momci. <laughs> A 
Aside from walking around the city, or stopping somewhere and playing folk music where there are lots of people passing by, such as Knez Mikhailova Street, they are often invited to weddings and celebrations. These bands are mostly made up of gypsies, and we consider them the best in what they do. For an extra buck, they'll follow you around and are sure to cheer you up if you're down. Or make a nice time even better. If you like folk music, of course. The romantic, the amorous Belgraders, who love enjoying wonderful views, like to go to Kalamegdan and watch the unbelievable sunsets. As the Serbian Nobel Prize laureate Ivo Andrić once wrote, the sky above Belgrade is wide and high, unstable, but always beautiful. Even during winter serenities, with their icy splendor, even during summer storms, when the whole of it turns into a single gloomy cloud, which, driven by the mad wind, carries the rain mixed with the dust of the Pannonian Plain, even in spring when it seems that it also blooms along with the ground, even in autumn when it grows heavy with the autumn stars and swarms, always beautiful and rich as a compensation to this strange town for everything that isn't there, and a consolation because of everything that shouldn't be there. But the greatest splendor of the sky above Belgrade that are the sunsets. In autumn and in summer, they are broad and bright like desert mirages, and in winter, they are smothered by murky clouds and dark red hazes. And in every time of year frequently come the days when the flame of that sun setting in the plain between the rivers beneath Belgrade gets reflected way up in the high celestial dome, and it breaks there and pours down over the scattered town. Then, for a moment, the reddish tint of the sun paints even the remotest corners of Belgrade and reflects into the windows even of those houses it otherwise poorly illuminates. And there truly is no better way to end the day than in the shadow of the symbol of Belgrade, the statue of the Pobednik, or Victor. The statue that holds a dove of peace in one hand and the sword of war in the other was erected in 1928 to commemorate the first Allied victory of World War I, the defeat of the Austro-Hungarian Empire by the Kingdom of Serbia in the Battle of Tser. Pobednik, one of the most famous works of Yugoslav sculptor Ivan Meštrović, looking forward towards the confluence of the Sava and the Danube and across the vast Pannonian plain towards the Fruška Gora mountain, is the most popular, most powerful and most compelling visual symbol of Belgrade, a symbol of its uniqueness and character. Belgrade is a city that's identity was formed through years of hardship and struggle. It was destroyed 40 times in its turbulent history. The resilience and spirit of its people resulted in their greatest achievement, and that is the city itself. A city at the mercy of world powers throughout most of its existence, it is finally free, the true capital of a democratic and newly transformed Serbia. An alluring and romantic city. A city of music and good food. A city rich with historical charm. From the streets of the old city center, to the grand architecture of old fortresses, mansions, and Orthodox churches. A frontier between East and West, Belgrade has been the confluence of culture and civilization in the Balkans throughout history. Embodied in Belgrade's DNA is the power to transform itself, but also to preserve remnants from the past. It is the fastest changing city in Europe. They say that every city embodies certain ideas or feelings. Love and passion is what fuels the vivacious and sparkling nightlife in Belgrade, unequaled and unique in the world. But what makes Belgrade my city of dreams is the energy, vitality, spontaneity and the heart and spirit of its people. A spirit that lives on to keep the city forever breathing and forever young. Kaš kad nismo tu, u
Planted about 170 years ago. According to the legend, this was the last tree that Prince Miloš ordered to be planted in a limestone hole. This is why the tree grew so fast and got its beautiful white color. In 1881, the tree had to be reinforced with iron because the 35 meter high tree couldn't withstand the weight of its branches. I can understand why Prince Miloš decided to build a mansion right here in Topčider Park. Even today, it's so tranquil and peaceful in these nice surroundings. Belgraders love their parks. Relaxing in Belgrade is serious business. There are 65 public parks in Belgrade that cover an overall area of 36 hectares. My favorite park is around the Kalemegdan Fortress. Kalemegdan, an old Turkish word for battlefield, is the most popular park among Belgraders and for many tourists who visit Belgrade. A green oasis in urban Belgrade, the park has many winding walking paths, picturesque fountains, shady benches, historical architecture, and breathtaking river views. It is also the oldest section of the urban area of Belgrade, and for centuries, the city's inhabitants converged only inside the walls of the fortress. Thus, the history of the fortress, until the most recent history, equals the history of Belgrade. Archaeological evidence suggests that the area of today's Belgrade was first settled some 7,000 years ago. The Neolithic Starchevo and Vincha cultures existed in or near Belgrade and dominated the Balkans. The Vincha script, a set of symbols found on artifacts from the Vincha culture, is considered the oldest excavated example of proto-writing in the world, predating the development of writing proper by more than a millennium. Right now, I'm about 14 kilometers from Belgrade center, in the small Belgrade suburb of Vincha, where one of the largest and most important prehistoric Neolithic settlements in Europe was discovered in 1908 by an archaeological excavation team led by Miloje Vasic, the first schooled archaeologist in Serbia. In the older Starčevo settlement, located in the deepest layers of Vincha, mud huts and tent roofs were discovered in which the settlers of the Starčevo culture lived and were also buried. During the period of the Vincha culture, houses built of wood that was covered with mud were erected above ground with complex architectural layouts in several rooms. The houses in the settlement are facing northeast, southwest, with streets between them. This is Belgrade, the dazzling capital of Serbia. People from all over the world are attracted to this city for its charm and beauty. From the quiet cafes to the sparkling nightlife, 
Belgrade is a city that never sleeps. It's one of the most fun cities in, in the whole world. It has magnificent architecture, peaceful parks, splendid restaurants with authentic Balkan food. Always. Remarkable art, electrifying museums. This is where it died. <laughs> a city between east and west, with a turbulent history to tell. But what makes Belgrade the most appealing is the spirit of its people. Belgrade has the most interesting men and the most enigmatic women. Some of the best sportsmen in the world are from Belgrade. Anyone who experiences Belgrade will undoubtedly fall in love with it. Welcome to my city. My name is Boris Melagursky. Everything that I love has its place in my city. This building holds one of the finest historical collections in Europe. The National Museum of Serbia in Belgrade has over 400,000 objects, including many great masterpieces by Renoir, Monet and Picasso. This is one of the things that put Belgrade at the cultural heart of Serbia. It is also a national treasure. Aside from priceless artifacts from all periods of Serbian mosques were destroyed, was because the Bairakli Mosque was turned into a Catholic church. When the Ottomans returned, they reinstalled it as a mosque. Today, there is very little physical evidence of the centuries-long Ottoman rule of Belgrade, but it did leave an influence on the culture. For most Belgraders, the day starts with the Turkish coffee. Though people in Turkey prefer to drink tea. On their way to work, they might pass by the Dorchal neighborhood. Dorchal being a Turkish word for intersection or four roads. On the car radio, they might listen to a type of music that is called turbo folk that has its origins here. A blend of Serbian brass bands and sometimes Middle Eastern beats and Turkish pop music. When the Turks left Belgrade for good in 1867, the city was once again the most significant city in the Balkans. During World War I, most of the subsequent Balkan offensives occurred near Belgrade, while the city itself was mostly destroyed. After the war, Belgrade became the capital of the new Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, later renamed the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. The new country crumbled when the Nazis heavily bombed and destroyed much of Belgrade in 1941 and carved up Yugoslavia between the Axis. Serbia was under military administration of Nazi Germany. Parts of Belgrade belonged to the independent state of Croatia, where the pre-war trade fairground was turned into the Sajmište concentration camp for Serbian Jews, Roma, and political prisoners. Later, Germans took control of it from the Croats. When the war was over, Belgrade became the capital of the communist Yugoslavia under Josip Broz Tito. During this time, Belgrade grew rapidly. Industries were nationalized and self-management by the employees was introduced by the government. There are people in Belgrade who will tell you that communism was the worst thing that ever happened to Belgrade, or Serbia for that matter. And there are those who will firmly argue that life was never better in Belgrade than during Tito's communist era. Based on the number of attending politicians and state delegations, Tito's funeral in Belgrade was the largest statesman funeral in history. He was buried in the House of Flowers in the Dedinje neighborhood of Belgrade. This wasn't just the death of a president, it was the death of an era, 
and the bloody dissolution of Yugoslavia was just around the corner. In 1980, the eyes of the world were on Belgrade. The East, the West, the... In history, the museum's greatest prized possession is the earliest example of Cyrillic manuscript in existence, Miroslav's Gospel, dating back from 1190. I believe Serbs are the most history-conscious people in the world. This collective memory is one of the main things that motivated Belgraders to start preserving and protecting the cultural heritage of Serbs in 1844, when the museum was founded. Belgrade is a town with a scent of history, passion, and a feel-good atmosphere. This is probably why Belgraders love it so much. I love Belgrade because of the spirit of its people. Belgrade has been called the Paris of the Balkans, a reputation fully supported by the gaiety and warm friendliness of its inhabitants. You never feel alone when you're in Belgrade. It's always easy to meet new people, mostly when you least expect it. Belgraders make the city what it is. But it didn't always used to be this way. For centuries, Belgrade was a city under occupation. The National Museum itself was a result of the Serbian National Awakening, when Serbia was fed up with Ottoman rule and demanded freedom. The first Serbian uprising that started in 1804 was a revolt against Ottoman control, led by Karadžorđe, founder of the Karadžorđević dynasty. This was the first time that Serbia envisioned becoming independent again, after three centuries of foreign occupation. Even though it was brutally crushed by the Ottomans in 1813, the revolt sparked the second Serbian uprising two years later, led by the founder of the Obrenović dynasty, which resulted with the creation of modern Serbia. The leader of the revolution, Miloš Obrenović, became prince of the newly formed Principality of Serbia, who knows what Serbia and Belgrade would look like today if it wasn't for this man. He was a true revolutionary and his legacy lives to this day. Nowhere is his spirit felt more than at the mansion he built for himself in Belgrade, the place where Prince Miloš died. This is also one of the last remnants of traditional Balkan architecture. Miloševkonak, Konak, as the mansion is called in Serbian, preserves the ambience of the anti-Ottoman struggle during these revolutionary times in an excellent historical exhibit. Next to the mansion, right here, this is one of the oldest and most beautiful platinous trees in Europe. Seven and a half thousand years of life in the continuity. Here in Vinci, it lived without a break, from five and a half thousand years before the new era, and in one moment, it did not break the life of all of us. 80% archaeological knowledge in Vinci was born in the first thousand years of life što će reći da se ovdje u Vinče najintenzivnije živjelo upravo u Neolitu. Vinče ne samo jedan od prvih evropskih gradova, nego Vinče je i prva evropska metropola. Around 270 BC, the Thracian Singi tribe that was settled here was replaced by the Celtic Skordisci, who were returning from their unsuccessful attack on Greece. The Celts gave the settlement its first name, Singidun, the town of Singi. When the Romans took over around the date of Christ's birth, they gave it a more Romanized name, Singidunum. One of the first Christian emperors of Rome, Jovian, was born in 331 AD in ancient Singidunum. The remains of the walls of the Roman legion camp, Castrum, can be found today in the Roman hall within the library of the city of Belgrade. Later, Avars, Goths, and Huns all took turns at occupying the city, until Serbs arrived to make Belgrade their capital in 1403. The city prospered during the rule of despot Stefan Lazarevich. He restored Belgrade and turned it into a political, cultural, trade, and tourism center. The new name of the city, Beograd, meaning White City, comes from a letter by Pope John VIII to Boris I of Bulgaria concerning the conduct of a local bishop. If you look at Belgrade today, it seems like it's everything but a white city, filled with all the colors of a palette. The walls and towers of today's Belgrade are purely white 
only on the city's coat of arms. In 1427, Belgrade fell under Hungarian control. And in 1456, Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror led an Ottoman army of 150,000 soldiers against Belgrade. With help from the Crusaders, the Turks were defeated. And it was considered such a great victory that the Pope ordered for all churches to ring their bells at noon every day in commemoration of the victory at Belgrade. I decided to take a trip back in time, and I visited the only remaining mosque in Belgrade out of the 273 that existed during Ottoman occupation. The Bayrakli Mosque was built around 1575 and the only reason it survived the two-decade Austrian rule in the 18th century when most of the other 